promoting a healthy environment. It's the air we breathe. Clean, safe water. Responsible management of our natural resources. We protect and restore for a sustainable future. Environment matters. I'm really excited about this project. I'm excited about the amount of community interest and support it's generated. Volunteers adapt an ancient farming technique to help control stormwater runoff in one eastern Panhandle community. Plus, when it comes up, there's trash okay. everywhere. I think it's pretty sad. Thousands of pounds of trash collected in this year's Canal River Sweep thanks to the hard work of dozens of volunteers. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Environment Matters. I'm Jake Glantz. A potentially dangerous situation near a former mine site is now safe because of the work of the DEP's Office of Special Reclamation. It happened near Webster Springs. The West Virginia State Police became aware of information that some old explosive materials were found in a bunker adjacent to the former Spring Ridge coal mine. Troopers investigated and found dynamite in blasting caps and contacted DEP. DEP inspectors determined that because the dynamite had become unstable, it would require the services of a specialized contractor to safely remove. It was a very unique project in the sense that uh, this, this uh, material laid here abandoned for well over 20 years. And uh, the storage uh, uh, facility that was in was certainly not one that uh, met the, the codes that are out today for safe storage and, and proper storage. So we ended up with a lot of uh, dynamite that actually uh, leaked the nitroglycerin out of the sticks. And of course, this is a major concern safety-wise because the uh, nitroglycerin uh, is, is very sensitive to impact or movement or anything like that when it's out in its raw form. The explosives were stored in a block building and small shed located outside the boundaries of the actual mine permit in a heavily overgrown area. Well, it was uh, a pretty dense vegetation. We had to cut our way back in. Uh, we were working with the state police. They were the ones that first found the uh, material. And uh, it's fortunate that someone had come forth with that information because uh, had the general public gone in there, uh, it could have been catastrophic because uh, uh, any kind of impact or movement uh, within those piles of, of the, the dynamite in there could have caused a detonation. State police secured the area so the contractor, Ram Explosive Technology Services, could begin work on the site. The DEP work with state police and local first responders to develop an emergency response plan in case of a problem during the removal operation. It took a while to get in there. We had to clear the area and then we opened it up. Uh, we could see how bad it was. Uh, we went in and did some explosive tests and immediately we had uh, very strong indications of, uh, of nitroglycerin. So we knew we had a major operation on our hands. So, at that point, uh, we went back to the laboratory, started testing, looking at what treatment would be the most effective uh, to, to attack it. Crews then used earth moving equipment to create a safety berm in and around the magazine. They placed logs and heavy blast mats over the roof of the structure to help contain any potential fragmentation should there have been an unplanned detonation. Ultimately, Ram used a chemical process to neutralize the dynamite and then safely remove the waste from the site. Blasting caps were separated and later destroyed with a controlled detonation. A nearby home and the county animal shelter were evacuated during this removal process. Uh, Webster County did a great job. Uh, there was a lot of people that stepped up to help with the uh, animal shelter to take the dogs temporarily for a while. We're glad that everything went well and, and uh, you know, special thanks to uh, the state police and DEP, uh, we had a lot of support, uh, you know, making the operation successful despite the weather and all that, uh, but uh, they did a great job, uh, Sergeant Murphy and his team and, and the whole DEP crew. We had uh, several groups involved, uh, Reclamation and Office of Explosives and Blasting as well um, that, uh, you know, help, help support us get this thing knocked out as quick as possible. Uh, you know, obviously everybody's primary interest was public safety and, and getting this thing resolved. Robert McClure says explosives are nothing to fool around with and that could cause serious injury or death 
with improper handling, especially as in this case where they've become unstable due to age and exposure to the elements. He says if you ever run across any, you should clear the area and call 911 and leave removal to the professionals. CSX Transportation has reached a settlement with the state of West Virginia, the EPA, and the Justice Department over that 2015 derailment and oil spill at Mount Carbon. According to a news release from the Justice Department, CSX resolved its liability for state and federal water pollution related violations related to this incident. Under the terms of the settlement, CSX will pay penalties of $1.2 million to the United States and $1 million to the state of West Virginia. On February 16, 2015, a CSX train with 109 rail cars derailed in Fayette County and Mount Carbon. 27 tank cars, each carrying about 29,000 gallons of Bakken crude oil, derailed, with about half igniting. The resulting fire and explosions destroyed an adjacent house and garage. A state of emergency was declared, shutting nearby water intakes and forcing residents from their homes. Some of the oil discharged during and following the train derailment flowed into Armstrong Creek and the Kanawha River. The proposed settlement is awaiting final court approval. Under a separate state negotiated provision, CSX has agreed to help improve surface water quality in the area impacted by the oil spill through a contribution of $500,000 to a state administered fund to upgrade a water treatment facility in Fayette County. For nearly 30 years, volunteers have spent one day in September cleaning up the banks of the Kanawha River. The DEP's Brianna Hickman joins us now with a look at this year's event. Jake, that first sweep attracted around 100 volunteers, and they've been coming back every year since. Rain or shine, they always show up. It's my Buffalo FFA chapter. We're out here just helping the community and cleaning up. The Kanawha River Sweep runs the entire length of the river from its head at Golly Bridge to the mouth in Point Pleasant. The first sweep back in 1990 netted an impressive 60 tons of material, everything from abandoned cars and appliances to illegally dumped tires and trash. The hall is typically much smaller these days. Here at Winfield Beach, just below the lock and dam, it's mostly trash, especially plastics. Like, there's McDonald's cups and Tudor's cups, gas station, just anything anyone's bring down here when they come fishing or it's just basic trash. Although there's less to clean up, the fact that the annual sweep is still necessary at all means there's still work to do when it comes to getting the message out about litter and the impact on the environment. I think it's pretty sad, I mean, how people treat our community, but some of it could be the river and how much the waters came on it. So when it comes up, there's trash okay. everywhere. I think it's pretty sad. Well, it doesn't show that people really care what it's like around here. Mm -hmm. They just come here and do their thing, and they leave what they have and just go. And that's what keeps these volunteers coming back year after year. Well, if you don't clean it up, the river will get all full of junk, and then people can't fish, and then you just lose that part of the environment. As with many of the cleanup programs organized by the DEP, volunteers are what make them all work. If you or your organization would like to take part in a future cleanup, visit our website, dep.wv.gov, to find out how you can help the DEP keep West Virginia beautiful and clean. For Environment Matters, I'm Brianna Hickman. Thank you, Brianna. Altogether, nearly 70 volunteers took part in this year's sweep, removing roughly 3,000 pounds trash. The DEP's Adopt a Highway and REAP programs recently hosted a volunteer appreciation picnic at Stonewall Resort to say thank you to the thousands of volunteers that help keep West Virginia's roadsides clean. Adopt a Highway coordinator Kim Smith presented Danny Montgomery of Masontown with the program's Volunteer of the Year Award. Montgomery, who's been a member of the Midway Gitters 4-H Club for 20 years, has been an integral part of the group's cleanup efforts in his tenure, having participated in over 60 cleanups. Montgomery also leads the group's conservation efforts by planting and maintaining a flower bed in the center of Mason Town each year and fostering and delivering a thousand tree seedlings to students, teachers, and personnel at Valley Elementary in Arthurdale. 
A list of all this year's winners is available on our website, dep.wv.gov. You'll also find information on how you or your group can volunteer for an upcoming cleanup event. Stormwater runoff is one of the leading causes of water pollution. When it rains heavily, water flowing across impervious surfaces like roofs, roads, and parking lots can pick up all sorts of surface pollutants that eventually get washed into the nearest stream. As we'll see, it's especially a problem in the community of Berkeley Springs, where a local watershed group is working on an innovative solution. The DEP's Terry Fletcher has these details. On a steep hillside in a cemetery in Berkeley Springs, volunteers and city crews are working on a solution to a massive drainage problem. They're using a technique called Hugelkultur. It's a German word first coined back in the 1960s to describe a farming practice that dates back centuries. So Hugelkulturs are basically a compost unit. Sometimes they're dug into the ground, most of them are above ground. It's mounded up organic matter is what they are. And these have been used to grow food for a very long time. They've recently become popularized again uh, for the same purposes because they're so effective. Now, this particular unit we are doing up here, these three units, are modified for erosion control. That is, we've dug into the hill and we want to make sure that they drain water out. The road, which is on a very steep grade, was already very hard to get up and down because of the washout from years worth of erosion from heavy rain. This used to be an asphalt road, and you could find asphalt now in maybe two or three places. So uh, the ruts were like that. It was, it was impassable. The Warm Springs Watershed Association consulted with a stormwater specialist with the DEP to come up with an affordable solution to keep the lower portion of the road from completely washing out. The answer, Hugel culture. We are building three hugels uh, designed to divert water into a ditch. Eventually the ditch will convey the stormwater runoff um, to a rain garden at the bottom of the hill. Uh, the water that is not diverted into the ditch will be slowed, absorbed, and filtered by the materials in the hugel culture. Um, what does go through will then go to the next Hugel culture, so that will greatly reduce the amount of stormwater further down the hill. Okay. Uh, the water will also, over time, break up the woody and the organic material in the trenches, turn it into uh, nutrient-rich soil. City crews use a backhoe to dig three shallow trenches across the roads, and then volunteers begin filling them with layers of dead tree limbs, straw, and compost. Eventually, woody stem plants are going to be planted in there, probably hazelnut trees or bushes. And so in the purpose here, we are preventing soil from running away. We're holding that and regreening the cemetery. Reducing soil erosion is especially important in a community like Berkeley Springs, located in a valley where Warm Springs Run flows through the middle of town. When sediment fills streams, storm water has nowhere else to go, making flooding problems become worse. This watershed, when we did our um, stream assessment in 2009, it was determined that we were 17% impervious surface. That's considered to be an urban watershed. It's very high even for like a city like Charleston. Um, we did an eye tree inventory of the watershed. Two years ago, we were up to 19% because we're beginning to see more and more development along the banks of the run. What's really shocking is this 19% impervious surface is in a four mile area. Once you get past Jimstown Road, uh, it's a perforated forest owned by U.S. Silica. So a four mile area is 19% impervious surface and growing in terms of impervious surface. The Watershed Association recently identified nearly 40 locations within that four mile area that could benefit from green stormwater management projects like the Greenway Cemetery Hugel Culture. They hope to work with the local conservation district to use some small watershed grant monies to determine how much stormwater would potentially be captured, slowed, and filtered by those projects and what impact would it have downstream. But the biggest benefit of this project with the funny sounding German name is the buzz it's generating. I'm really excited about this project. I'm excited about the amount of community interest and support it's generated. And I'm very excited that 
thanks to the work that Streetscapes and we have been doing, the school board, um, the Morgan, our local paper, uh, people in the community are becoming interested in what they can do on their property to also try and do green stormwater management. So I, if, if more people in the community were to use these practices, I think the impact, the potential impact would be huge. I mean, streams flood, that's what streams are, de are designed to do, but we can reduce the severity of flooding. Kate says she even plans to use the idea to help with her own stormwater runoff problem by installing a hoogle at the top of her own steep gravel driveway. In Morgan County, I'm Terry Fletcher for Environment Matters. The project was funded through a Stream Partners grant. Stream Partners is a joint program of the DEP, the West Virginia Conservation Agency, the State Division of Forestry, and the Department of Natural Resources. It's housed within the DEP's Division of Water and Waste Management and provides grants to support the efforts of local watershed groups to help improve the quality of life in and around their stream or watershed. For more information on the program and to find out more about green stormwater projects like rain gardens that can incorporate that you can incorporate into your landscape, visit our website, dep.wv.gov. Student artists from kindergarten through 12th grade are invited to enter the 2019 Ohio River Sweep Poster Contest. Our friends at Orsanko are accepting entries through December 21st from students living in counties along the Ohio River and its major tributaries. One grand prize winner will be used to create promotional materials for the sweep, and the student artist will receive a $500 prize, along with $100 awarded to their school to purchase art supplies. There will also be 13 winners, one for each grade level, that will each take home a $50 prize. One of last year's grade level winners was Cameron Tyree from Wahama High School in Mason County. Contest rules and entry forms are available on Orsanko's website, orsanko.org. The 2019 edition of the Ohio River Sweep will be the 30th anniversary of the event, which is the largest one-day cleanup event, volunteer cleanup event, in the country. Well, they tried weed killer and it didn't work. They tried pulling it up and it grew back. Now the National Park Service is trying a different tactic when it comes to dealing with invasive plant species in a New River Gorge historic district. The DEP's Mike Huff has the details. Welcome to Thurman, West Virginia, population five. If you're not familiar with Thurman, don't let the sleepy appearance fool you. This used to be a boom town. A busy hub on the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway, Thurman was home to several businesses, banks, locomotive servicing facilities, and a busy rail yard servicing more than two dozen coal mines. The town's historic district is now owned by the National Park Service, the former train station, a visitor center. Aside from the occasional passing freight, these days it's pretty quiet. You could even call it a ghost town. But for the past few weeks anyway, you could also say it's a goat town. These four-legged weed eaters are taking on a hillside full of kudzu, multiflora rose, and Japanese knotweed, invasive plant species that are threatening to take over the town. Our resource management crew was, has been very interested in trying to get rid of the kudzu primarily in Thurmond. And that is such a steep hillside and putting people in there to do the work really creates a safety hazard and they've tried it before and it really hasn't been effective. So she had seen somewhere else they were working with goats and thought that they would be a great fit for here. The goats are owned by Larry and Ann Sahanik. We spoke to Larry by phone. Most of our goats are what we call retired milkers and retired family goats and are given to us by people who can't keep them because the kids aren't in 4-H or the goat doesn't milk or it doesn't, it doesn't get pregnant or one thing or another and for some reason they can't keep it. Larry got into the goat landscaping business by accident. After retiring from a career in advertising, he and Ann moved to Rhinebeck, New York, where they had seven or eight goats. Then they got a call. I 
a park in New York City adjacent to the Verrazano Bridge in Staten Island called Fort Wadsworth uh, had trees whose roots were spreading the rocks on a Civil War gun emplacement. And they wanted the, uh, the, the, the trees down, but their guys wouldn't cut the trees because there was thorns and poison ivy all over. So they had Cornell uh, University contact 400 goat owners uh, in the surrounding area, which is probably over 100 miles, uh, asking if someone would come down there and eat the poison ivy, poison ivy and thorns. Of the 400, eight people responded. Seven said it couldn't be done, and we went down and did it. And so Green Goats was born. They currently have around 180 goats working in five states. They're wrapping up their stay in Thurman for this year, but they'll be back next spring. They'll, they'll make a noticeable difference. They, uh, uh, we, we typically uh, bring goats in earlier in the season. Uh, we normally bring goats into a job between late, late May and late June in that range. And uh, we bring in a limited number of goats per acre and we vary the number with the objective of having goats have something to eat until the end of the growing season, which is typically uh, September, October, maybe down where you are, early November. Uh, and that, that, by doing that, they're constantly stressing the plants and the plants, uh, the plants' root systems are stressed and compromised and most of them don't store enough energy to, to come back in the spring. The Thurman Goat Project is scheduled to last three years. If the goats are successful at reducing the load of invasive plants, particularly the kudzu, the Park Service will seed the area with native grasses and wildflowers. Once the kudzu starts growing up into the trees, it also surrounds some of the historic buildings. And so when it gets dry and it has the potential to carry fire, you know, anything in its path is going to be in trouble. It grows so quickly that it takes over everything here. And what ends up happening is it really, it almost forms like a mat over the landscape and it crowds out a lot of the native species. Uh, we see it a lot in some of the historic areas. Uh, so it, it is a problem. If this goes well, then we're likely to use them in other areas of the park. Just with the, the, steep, the steep topography here, and the goats are definitely more sure-footed than we are, so um, we're looking for good things from them. For Larry, the goats are more than just a hobby. I'm, I'm a very realistic, older city guy who's been around a bit, but when I was in the advertising business, <clears throat> maybe I got you to buy more Coors than, than Schaefer or Budweiser. If, or I got you to use the American Express card a little more than a Visa card. The bottom line is, maybe I contributed, maybe I didn't, but it was a zero-sum game. It just one went up, one went down. All of a sudden here, and we're not saving the planet, but I'm finally doing something that really makes a difference. It's improving something. It's, it, it, something, some, the place is ahead. It's not just one goes up, one goes down. Larry says his goats aren't camera shy, but when we were there, well, let's just say they were focused on the task at hand, despite our best efforts. Hey, goat, goat. If you go to Thurman to see the goats, they are within a three acre plot, so they're not all in one area. It's almost like a wildlife watching adventure. Probably binoculars would be a great tool. We don't call them goats rescues, but I, I really like goats. Uh, and I, I, I hate to see a perfectly healthy goat be sent off to the meat market. So we're, we're giving them a purpose. They, eat, they live the American dream. They eat for a living. And from the looks of things, they love their work. In Thurmond, I'm Mike Huff for Environment Matters. You can follow the adventures of Larry's goats by visiting their website. It's right there on your screen. The DEP's REAP program was honored recently by Mon River Trails Conservancy and the Preston County Parks and Recreation Commission as one of the donors for the new Masontown Trailhead restroom facilities. The Elkins Coal and Coke Building, built in 1907, will now serve as restrooms for the Deckers Creek Rail Trail and West Virginia Byway Old Route 7. 
It's the first public restroom facility serving the 19 and a half mile trail that extends from the outskirts of Reedsville to Morgantown, where it connects to the 29 mile Mon River Rail Trail. In 2011, this building was placed on the endangered properties list by the Preservation Alliance of West Virginia. REAP worked to help clean up the building and surrounding property and provided a dumpster and hauled away all the trash and tires. Besides the restrooms, the trailhead has been improved with a drinking fountain and special places for your four-legged hiking buddies, along with vending machines, improved parking, and new trailhead signs. And speaking of hiking trails, we leave you now along the Rind Trail in the New River Gorge National River in Fayette County. The Rind Trail follows the path of a long abandoned rail line along Arbuckle Creek and overlooks the New River. On behalf of all of us here at the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. More than 800 people with one mission, promoting a healthy environment. We are the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection.